Paul Johnson, welcome to the Running Effect podcast. How are you doing this evening? Doing good. Thanks for having me, man. I did ask you this a minute ago, but before recording, but for the sake of the people listening now, how are the legs feeling? Legs feel good. Um, I'm kind of learning how to burst still. Um, the whole picking up motion of the feet is kind of an odd feeling to me right now, so we're working on that. I just got a pedicure, knocked down all the calluses, so we're doing all right. I think this run really put you on the map, uh, no pun intended there. When, where do you feel like the story of Paul Johnson really starts to give greater context to this incredible adventure you went on before we dive into it? I think it started summer of 2022, because that's really when like, I sort of got into running and the running journey started, uh, because my buddy, I mean, I, I ran you know, once every two days for like three miles, like I think many people who are trying to stay active can relate to. Um, and my buddy said, hey, let's run the Marine Corps Marathon together. And it's in five months, but let's try to go sub three hours. And that's really what started the whole journey for me. Growing up, were you active in other sports? Did you do running or was this something that purely came on later in life? I did. I played soccer um, for about 10 years or so. Um I was good at running. Yeah, I wasn't so great at the soccer, but I could just run up and down the field all day long playing midfield. So, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a, a tendency there for the running. But I stopped that, I think, like 10th grade in high school. Um, and I really didn't do any other sports. Um, in college, I got into triathlon for a little bit for about two years. And then once I graduated, commission, went overseas, like kind of just fell off again. I think a lot of people in life, when they hit a certain age and they haven't done something, they kind of put themselves in a box and and think, oh, you know, that running thing's not for me. I should have started when I was in high school or middle school. You know, it's not for me. What would you say to someone listening who's inspired by you and your story and is maybe for the first time in their life considering picking up something like running? What would you say to them in terms of it's never do too it. late to start? If you want to do it, do it. Um, yeah, I would... I tell people, and I still truly believe it, I'm by no means like an elite athlete. You know, I, I've accomplished this awesome thing, and that's really cool. But when you look at like the people who are doing this professionally or at the Olympics, like it's very hard to stack up and get to that level. Um, and they've worked on it for years and years and a, a lot of their life. Um, yet here I am, and I've only been in uh, you know, been running like consistently for about 20, 22 months, like just under two years. Um, and I've been in the ultra running world for only exactly one year. Like last weekend was my one year mark of ultra running. Um, yet here I am accomplishing this pretty insane you know, task of, of running across the United States. And, you know, what I say to that is you literally just have to say, and commit that you want to do something and then just start having fun with it. Um, set a goal, start with something small and then build up from there and, and just don't stop setting bigger goals for it. So you mentioned just about a year ago, you passed, you know, the first time of ever doing something in the ultra space. If we were to go back to that version of Paul Johnson, tell him what you were going to do <laughs> over the past, you yeah. know, a few months, what would you uh, say? He would know it's coming. I, uh, I've been thinking okay. about the Transcon for, I mean, I first heard of it in 2017 when Pete set the current record because um, he ran through uh, State College PA where I was at school at Penn State um, when I was there. And so I'd heard of it, but I was like, oh, whatever, like, cool. So this guy's running, you know, didn't really think much of it. And then when I got back stateside in like 2021, 20, I think, um, I had heard of Hella Sabid doing his transcon. And so that kind of reminded me of it. And it's like, wow, that would be kind of cool to do. Except like, I don't think I can run, you know, 40 plus miles a day, let alone a marathon a day. Um, and so I kind of started thinking about it. I'm like, well, if I want to get to that stage, what do I have to do? I'm like, I have to start running. And so it was kind of the transcon was in the back of my head for probably about two years or so that I wanted to do this thing. And getting into the ultra running was 
that big kind of leap of faith that I had to take of, all right, let's go run a hundred mile race and let's see how we hold up. Take me through the planning process of something like this. I, I am sure that there is so much that goes beyond the scenes, behind the scenes. Take me through what truly goes into planning for something like this, how many months it took before even you started this thing. Yeah, the there was a lot of little things that I was doing uh, for about a year, starting to kind of pitch to some sponsors, pitch to some other people about it. Um, but the bulk of the planning took off about uh, beginning of October. So was that six months, seven months? Um, and it was a lot. I mean, logistics alone are a nightmare in terms of just getting, how do you find a crew that can drop what they're doing for two months to come support this? Uh, that's a huge ask. Um, so trying to get the crew and then there's always going to be issues. Like one of our crew members um, had a schedule change with the military. And at the last second, they're like, hey, you can't go um, anymore, even though you have all this vacation approved. So that was now I got to find new crew members last minute. It's so that was a major issue. Um, and then once we hit November, December time frame, it was just, you know, the training was ramped up and the planning is like, starting to nail down, um, okay, the RV, what's our budget for everything, finalizing the budget, trying to get all the sponsors on board and, and get them locked in. Um, so it's a it's a massive effort. Basically, I would, I would get home from work, I'd finish up whatever workouts I had, and then the remaining two, three hours of the night were spent on on planning and logistics. What did preparation look like from a training perspective to put your body in a position to Run how many miles a day did you uh, average? Just it? under sixty. I think it was like fifty nine point eight or so. We'll yeah, call it crazy. sixty. So, so yeah. So how do you prepare yourself to run sixty miles a day for fifty two days? It, you know, there's really, there's no like plan. Like you can't just Google how to run, how to train to run the transcon, right? I mean, I can go Google how to train for a marathon. I'll get hundreds of plans how to run a five k, whatever. But the transcon, I mean so few people have done it and there's just not a lot of information on it. So, you know, we just kind of based it off of, okay, how did Pete roughly train for this thing? And obviously he's got a lot more experience. He's been in the sport a lot longer where it's like, Hey, all right, start doing, start building up, start hitting 200 mile weeks in training and then roll into it. We'll see how we go. See how the body holds up. So, you know, I've been running, I had a run streak going for like, a little over a year. So I was doing all that, just kind of keeping the body engaged for the whole year, doing my races. And then October, when it kicked off, uh, no, beginning of November, when I kicked off like the targeted training, I started at about 100 to 130 miles a week, I think. And then every like six weeks or every three or four weeks, we were bumping up the mileage. Um, so we went from like, 100 to 130, that went to 150, 170, and then we did a couple 200 mile weeks. You know, I wasn't able to hit the um, consistency that I wanted for multiple 200 weeks, 200 mile weeks in a row, just due to schedules and everything else I had going on. But we were still hitting some serious miles. And then the final week, we just brought it back a little bit and jumped head into it. As someone who's newer to the sport and doesn't have a lifelong history of building up mileage and, you know, getting your tendon, you know, the training load that you can accumulate over the years. Are you a little surprised with how durable you are? I like in my head, I laugh at a 200 mile week. Cause I'm like, I would break. Yeah. And I know it takes time to get up to that point, but as someone who's relatively new, are you surprised with, you know, just how well suited Paul Johnson is for the sport of running to a degree? Um, like I remember when, in 2022, when I started training for that first marathon, I remember the first week that I hit 30 miles that week, I thought my legs were going to snap in half. I was like, there's no way I can keep up this training volume, like 30 miles a week. There's no way. Um, and I kind of dialed back a bit. And then eventually I was finishing at like 60 or 70 miles a week training for that marathon. And so it's just a matter of, it takes time, but you can very quickly get used to it. Um, and, you know, and to make a jump from, 
you know, 15 miles a week to 30 miles a week. That's massive compared to making a 130 to 150, just, you know, in terms of scale and ratio. So, um, you know, I started small, eventually worked myself up to 30, up to 70. And that was, you know, in that last two year window. Um, and then I didn't start running 100 mile weeks till January of 23. And then I just kind of dove in, did three months straight of it. Um, and the body, like the first couple of weeks were rough, but then as the body kind of adapted, just like the transcon where the body starts getting used to the load, it becomes pretty easy, relatively speaking. Um, you know, not having that background and lifetime training with the running that you were just talking about. I think what helped me out a lot is the amount of strength training that I do in the gym. Um, you know, I think a lot of these people that you see are these lifelong runners, um, at least for distance running, you know, they're typically not the most muscular or muscle mass individuals. Um, you know, sure, they go to the gym and, and they work certain parts of the body, but and I'm no by no means a bodybuilder, but I like going to the gym and trying to pick up as heavy of weights as I can, whatever it is, like bench press, squatting, triceps, biceps, like, and I think that, um, I think that work in the gym is what enabled me to kind of withstand that beating, even though it was kind of a short window. What's that reflection process there when you state to me in reflection, going back in time, that version of yourself that you felt like your legs were going to snap in half running 30 miles a week to then very recently running, we'll call it 60 miles a day across the US. Is it crazy to reflect on how far you've come in the sport? Yeah, it's... Um... It's kind of insane to think about because I, I distinctly remember thinking about the transcon two years ago and thinking, you know, think about like Hella because he was kind of the most recent person in my mind to have run it then. And he was doing 40 miles a day. And I'm like, how, like, it's just, it's not conceivable to me because I can barely run 30 miles a week. And then you just kind of start doing it. Like you start the process, like you have to start somewhere um, like, okay, let's start working on it. And eventually just staying after in the consistency and committing to being like, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Um, it is pretty wild to think about. And I kind of, I think I kind of cherish that moment of when I think back to that 40 miles a day is insane. And now I'll go for a 40 mile run on the weekend just for fun. And like, that's just one day of the week. So it's such a shift that, that's taking place. <laughs> I know we've used the word transcon a bunch in this conversation, so maybe I'm 14 minutes late to ask you this question. But before we hop into the journey itself, would you describe what that word means to the Absolutely. listener? Absolutely. Uh, transcontinental. So running across the United States, uh, coast to coast, you can go whichever way you want. You can take any route you want. Um, but typically we you start on the West coast and you head East just so you can get the Rockies out of the way first, the deserts out of the way. Um, and typically, you know, weather travels West to East. So ideally you get a little bit more tailwind than you do headwind, but that's up for debate. I can tell you from my experience. Um, and yeah, it's just get from West, get, get coast to coast on foot and, you know, see how fast you can do it. Or maybe it's not even how fast you can do it. It's, you're just out there for the journey. Um, you know, I have a buddy that started, he started the same day as me, Andrew Linder. We both started March 1st at a uh, Santa Monica pier. He's doing it with a 15 pound weight vest right now. And he's got like, I think he has like 20 days left. He's in Ohio right now. Um, and you know, is he, was he going as fast as me? No, but he, he's doing something completely different that nobody's ever done before. And he's enjoying the process. And to think that, I know what I went through to do 3000, but he's doing it with a 15 pound vest on the whole time. Um, there's another guy, Laz, he's pretty infamous in, in the ultra running community um, with like the Barkley marathons. He's doing a transcon right now. He started like uh, two or three weeks ago and he's walking from DC to like Seattle, I think. So, you know, it's, Oh my gosh. I think when people talk about it initially, they're like, you have to go fast. 
um, and see how fast you can get there. But I think a lot of it is just take it as your own journey. Um, anybody, I, I literally say anybody can do the transcon. It's just a matter of how much time it takes and it's okay to take longer. I think a lot of listeners right now are have the same question in their head, which is why? Why would you do something like this? It looks like fun. I mean, that's that's what initially got me interested in it. Um, but the the bigger message with it is what running has done for me personally um, in terms of mental health. So like past couple of years, I've definitely struggled a lot with um, – anxiety, depression, sleep issues, like you name it. I've, I've been kind of dealing with the past couple of years, um, coming back from overseas. And, you know, typically that's coped with, with drinking and alcohol. Um, but when I started doing the running for the marathon, I'm like, dang, I really can't go out and destroy myself drinking and try to get up and do this long run to get ready for this, this race coming up. Um, and it was one of those kind of reflection moments where I'm like, all right, I told my friend I was going to do this with him. Like, I have to train. So you know, the drinking started dialing back. And that's when a lot of the kind of symptoms that I've been experiencing with mental health really started to show up because it was being masked by by the alcohol. Um, and so as those kind of came up, I started realizing that the more I ran – the better it would make me feel. And it just kind of be, running became like my new coping mechanism with the physical activity. Um, and so you, that has kind of sort of been a really close thing to my heart the past couple of years, um, especially within like the military and, and the veteran community. Myself, a lot of my friends, sailors, all dealing with their own individual issues. And I think that the the strongest thing there that has helped the most people and definitely helps me is just continuing to be physically active. And, you know, once I sort of identified that in the, in the last, you know, two years, um, it almost became a, a natural progression of, you know, I want to do this run, but I think to do it, you've got to have, you have to have a why behind it. And, you know, that really became my why for it was, you know, bringing the awareness for the mental health. And then, you know, in partnership with that, uh, you know, fundraising that we were doing for Team Red, White, and Blue, which is their mission with, you know, physical and mental health is exactly aligned with kind of how I felt about it. I can leave a link to it in the show notes, but can you elaborate on where people can help and despite your journey ending, uh, continuing to help and support the cause that you uh, valiantly ran for across the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, you can head over to pauljohnson.run. Um, you know, that's the event site that we had set up. It's, it's still active. We're leaving it up. Um, I mean, it's got all the information about the run from the route, daily miles, the crew, whole bunch of information in there. You can go and watch the, uh, we've got the whole YouTube series, we do weekly episodes that are posted, um, and kind of go through that. Um, but most importantly, we have all of the connections for team red, white, and blue, including the donation link. Um, you know, you know, at the time we're recording this, we're, I want to say right around $590,000 raised. Um, our goal is to hit 1 million by the end of the year. Um, we're moving along still. So interested in supporting, we love, we love the support. Pauljohnson.run, get the donations in. I'm curious, like, uh, I would say my podcast is decently big within the running community and, and hopefully it can help you out. So appreciate any generosity from the listener, but with how crazy your story is, have you thought about like trying to get on a rich roll or a Joe Rogan or a massive <laughs> podcast where it's like, inevitably you would probably get over your goal by just sharing your story and talking to that type of massive audience. Yeah. Um, I'm not actively pursuing anything with that. Um, you know, my kind of approach to it, I think is, is like with what we're doing here, you know, just the very natural and organic, hey, you're interested in the story. You think your viewers are interested in the story. And so, you know, we set this up. Um, you know, I'm not actively pursuing people for podcasts or interviews. Um, if, if individuals are reaching out, we, we, we try to set up and, and see what we may or may not be able to do. Um, 
And I think that's the best way to get the word out because that means that that individual or you know that audience is actually interested and invested what the story and what we have to talk about because this story doesn't resonate with everyone. I totally get that. Um, and so having that like authentic um, connection is kind of kind of important to me. You know, I think at some point. Hopefully, I hope one of those individuals might be interested and in, uh, you know, reach out. And maybe we'll do something. But you know, in the meantime, we're kind of plugging along. Um, I'm hoping we're putting together a uh, documentary for the trip. You know, what we put on YouTube and social media was only about 10% of what actually happened out there, and a lot of behind the scenes that we're we're looking forward to showing. And so, when that documentary comes out in the fall, we're looking to um, get a lot more word out through that when, when we start to release it. Let's talk about day one. How are you feeling when you hit the start button on the GPS watch? What were the, what were the feelings? Were you excited? Were you nervous? Were you fearful? Take me through it. I wanted to throw up. Um, that morning when I woke up, like my stomach was not happy. It's just from being so nervous and anxious about it. Um, like I sat in the RV till the very last minute, just like headphones on music blasting and just like thinking to myself, Oh my God, we are actually about to start this. Like to think that we're here on the start day. And, you know, two years ago, it was just like a, a cool idea I had. Um, and then thinking about like all of the pain that I'm about to go through and how long of a journey this is going to take. And think about how far away 3000 miles is like I was, I was so nervous, like I, I just wanted to throw up. And then, on the final seconds, when we we started the watch, uh, like I said, Andrew started at the same time, so went over, gave each other a hug. We started like pretty much right away, and you know, within those first thirty seconds, all the nervousness went away. And it's just like, okay, I'm running. I know running. Let's do this. Was there any point during this that you thought you wouldn't make it or you were ready to throw in the towel, but you persisted? Every single morning. Every single morning I wanted to quit um, that first hour of the day where you just woke up, I'm exhausted, um, it's cold, it's dark, my legs are stiff and not working, like I can barely walk the first couple miles. Um everything hurts every single morning during that first hour. Like the only thing running through my head is we are not going to make it to New York. It is too far away. Um, it's just, it's just not possible. Like we're not gonna be able to make it like this is, this is going to be where it ends. Um, you know, that was every, that was every single day. There's a couple days, um, in New Mexico specifically when later in the day where I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, if I could just get hit by a car now and have a reason to quit, that would be awesome. Um, obviously, you know, don't want that to actually happen, but like, that's the mindset, you know, sometimes you got to get into that. You got to try to get yourself out of. Um, so yeah, every single day I wanted to quit. What are some lessons you learned about yourself as you persisted through those feelings of wanting to quit? You know, for 52 days straight, it says everything about who you are as a person. It, um, I think it says a lot about resiliency and for lack of better words, suck it up. Um, like being one of the amazing things about like the sport of ultra running is how many highs and lows you experience. Um, it's, it's a long race. I mean, you go out do a hundred mile race, it's going to take you anywhere from 15 to 40 hours, you know, depending on the course. And that's such a long period of time that you have all of these, you know, ups and downs. And it's such an incredible experience to have those highs, but the equally low lows. Whereas you look at something like a marathon and, you know, it's a two to, I don't know, seven hour race. And there's really not that much time to kind of hit those, those lows. Like you usually have like the energy of the race and it gets you through when you reach the end. Um, 
And that's what makes, I think, ultra running just as much mental as it is physical because you know you're going to hit your lows and you just have to power through them because eventually that look like my lows were every single morning. And as long as I can power through that low and just keep moving, eventually that feeling is going to subside and that high is going to come back. And, you know, sure enough, every single morning, like get an hour and an hour and a half in, um, you know, sun starts coming up, the legs are loosening up finally, um, mentally, I'm able to find a little bit of positivity and all of a sudden, you know, I go from being able to barely walk and, and wanting to quit to running 10 minute miles and feeling like I'm on top of the world. So, um, I think for me, it just shows like you're going to get beat up, but if you just keep at it and keep being consistent, it's going to go away. You're going to be able to overcome it. I think a lot of people think that when in the middle of a race, when a negative thought pops up or, or when they feel the feelings of wanting to quit, that the end result isn't going to be good because their mind is thinking negatively. I've certainly experienced the opposite. And I think you're a testament that those thoughts are inevitable. It's just a question of whether you act on them or not. What would you say to someone who, who struggles with overthinking the negative thoughts? I mean, I overthink the, I don't think, I don't think anybody's immune to it. At some point, everybody's going to have from the brand new runner to the uh, elite athlete who's been doing it for 20 years. Um, you're going to have those negative thoughts almost every single race. Like you can't avoid it. Um, and you just have to, it's going to come up. You can dwell on it, but eventually you've got to, you've got to move on and start thinking about what, what the future is going to be when you keep moving. Um, at least that's been the trick for me is, you know, I try to pull myself out of that moment where I'm hurting and I just want it to all end. I want to quit. And I try to think about, okay, in five miles, it's probably not going to hurt anymore. Um, and I started thinking about, yo, well, when I'm done with this thing, I'm going to eat a lot of ice cream. And I started getting, I try to distract myself, you know, getting myself out of that present moment of pain and, and thinking about, you know, how amazing the future is going to be when I get to lay in a big hotel bed for eight days straight. Um, and I think that's what personally helps me you know, move through those inevitable low moments. During a run like this, and when you're running 60 miles a day, you know, I, I can't even imagine the amount of time that you get with yourself and with your thoughts. And in society today, we're so overstimulated on our phones, watching movies, just constantly listening to podcasts, listening to music. I'm sure you had hours each day where it was just you and your thoughts. What are some things you learned about yourself during this journey of being with yourself and your thoughts probably more than you're used to? Um, I learned how to whistle. That was cool. Um, no, I mean, it is a lot of time by yourself. Um, I want to thank God for Spotify. That's Spotify got me through the transcon. Um, <laughs> you know, I can listen to the same song on repeat for 10 hours straight and be totally fine with it. Um, but what I think I probably learned most about myself is my ability to just be content. Um, I mean, it is, like I said, it's just as much mental as it has physical. And at the end of the day, like your brain is just so cooked from the running, from constantly looking around, constantly just looking where your feet are going, looking at your watch, looking at the car going by. So it's just, it's mentally exhausting. And when I say, I think, I understood how content and it has to go with, you know, being by myself. And, you know, there's so many times where I just kind of like almost like a meditation and like you, you, you Zen out um, and you blink and all of a sudden you're you know, five more miles down the road, but it doesn't feel like you've done it. Um, I think that ability to just be content with, you know, where you're at and not worrying too much about what else is going on was big for me because I definitely always overthink everything. I can't go to sleep at night because I'm thinking about all, all sorts of things. Um, like what color socks I wore today and how, I don't know. Um, but that 
learning that I can just lock in and kind of and zone out and just be happy in that moment was was kind of cool to experience. Can you take me through logistically what the eating situation like and what the sleeping situation was like? I guess a better way to frame this was like, what did a general day of of this transcon look like? I'm sure there's variety depending on the day yeah. if you're feeling good or struggling, but generally what did it look like from from sunrise to sunset? Um so we had two vehicles. The crew slept and lived in the RV, and then I had a like Ford Transit van that I slept in. So like they could do their thing without bothering me. Um, so at like 4:45 every morning, they'd come banging on the side of the van to wake me up. Um, getting ready, we would you know start running by 5:30, and then from 5:30 or whatever our start time was, we allocate a 15 hour window for running. And that 15 hour window included like bathroom, naps, lunch. Um, You know, from the time we started to 15, basically 15 hour window on my feet. And the goal was by that 15 hour mark. So 8.30 PM in this case, it was either hit 60 miles or it was stop at 8.30, wherever we're at. Um, so the goal was always, you know, it's like a little race for me every day. You know, can I get to 60 by 8.30 p.m.? And we just grind through it as, as fast as I can. Typically, if I can hit four miles in the first hour of the day, that's a pretty fast. Uh, be anywhere from like three to four miles, just a lot of walking, trying to get the body moving. Um, I probably had to you know, code brown about four times a day was the average. Um, And then quite honestly, one of the hardest parts about all that is the eating because you're burning so many calories that you have to constantly eat in order to be able to get enough in because you can't just eat it all in one sitting. Um, You know, we were doing about 10 to 12,000 calories a day. And so constantly throughout the day, like every 10 minutes or every mile, the crew's feeding me like Oreos, donuts, you know, pancakes, whatever it is, constantly just trying to get that food and calories into my mouth. Um, And then we would try to hit, um, the goal was 11 mile increments. So get to 11 miles and then I get a seven minute nap and like a 15 minute rest. And then 22, I get my seven minute nap and, and a little break. Um, you know, that was the goal. I think by the end, what we were doing was I would take a nap at like mile four and then I'd take another one at mile like 12. And then I would push straight through from like 12 to 33 because I would feel good. The sun's up, my body's finally working. Um, but 33, mile 33 was just over our halfway point. So that was our lunch stop every day. And the goal was to be there by 1.30 p.m. So was that nine hours, ten, eight hours? Yeah, eight hours. We wanted to be at mile 33 every day. That was our goal. Um, and we were pretty consistent on it. I mean, no matter how short of naps or how few bathroom breaks I took, how little rest I took, how fast I ran, how slow I ran, Somehow we just always kept ending up finishing like right at 120, 130 at that mile 33 mark. Um, and that would be our big break for the day. So we'd spend about an hour there. Um, I'd get some decent food, like steak and mac and cheese was like my absolute favorite lunch meal. Um, we'd get a bunch of that down, a bunch of caffeine. I'd take it immediately lay down for like a 20 minute nap. They'd wake me up, you know, a couple more minutes of, shoveling food in my mouth and then we get running again and then we'd run from 2 30 until we finished for the day and then that gave us about two hours in the evening from 8 30 to 10 30 where get dinner wrap things up for the day kind of decompress um get a very quick shower like a 60 second shower um and then in bed lights out by 10 30 each night was there a point during this journey that you thought to yourself and you truly believed like money's in the bag? I got this. We're good. 
I got, I still have to do the work, but like, I know I'm going to finish at this point. Um, probably some point in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, a lot of people like historically across the transcon people really underestimate Pennsylvania and the Appalachian mountains. Um, everybody thinks that once you clear the Rockies, like there's no more vert, you're good. Um, and well, yeah, you crest the Rockies at 9,000 feet and you've been doing 4,000 foot climbs every day. You get to Pennsylvania and it only caps out at 3,000 feet, but there's no flat roads in Pennsylvania. You're always going up or you're always going down. And so, you know, that last week, I was doing five to 6,000 feet of vert every single day in Pennsylvania because you're just constantly going up and down. And I think a lot of people, they're just, they're not prepared for it. They didn't, they don't know to expect that. Um, or they hear about it, but, and like for me, having lived in Pennsylvania, like I know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, and I think mentally that shocks a lot of people and, you know, beats them up physically and mentally. But at the same time, I think a lot of people, when you hit Pennsylvania and you've got that week left, you know, short of a, you know, an act of God type of thing, like, you're like, I know I can get myself to the finish line. Um, and I don't think it's till like that week out that you're in your head, you're like, I've got this. Take me through the final day in New York City and also give some context to what the NYPD did for you that <laughs> I think was pretty historic given yeah. uh, you weren't a president. Yeah, that was insane. Um, so we started s slowing down the miles in the last week because we wanted to finish on the Sunday afternoon in New York City because we figured that's going to get us the biggest turnout for support from, you know, anyone who wanted to come out and run. Um, and so as we're kind of tapering that down and starting to line, line up the finish, um, you know, we started talking about, you know, how big of a crowd are we actually going to have for this thing? Um, and the more we talked about it, um, you know, the crew was like, I think it's going to be like 200. And I was like, honestly, I think we could end up with close to a thousand people. Like, a part of this and it's just going to be a mob running down the road and we're like this is just going to be a train wreck and so we started like poking around with nypd we're like you know how is there any way we can get like a small escort or like something or anything um you know what about fdny type of thing and then through someone through someone through someone had a connection with uh the nypd running club and they had an event scheduled that day already for something else. And they heard what we were doing. And when we were getting there, they basically canceled their event, had the NYPD running team instead come run with us. And then they did what they called, what they like wrote an email to us is like a presidential escort through New York City, which is insane. Because like you said, I, I'm not a president, nor will I probably ever be one. Um like that's never been done for before, as far as I can tell, like the history of New York city. Um, and it was to the level of coming across the George Washington bridge. Um, we took the footpath we, they, initially they're going to shut down the bridge for us, but it just that they, 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 ca they came back and they're like, actually, never mind, We don't want to do that just because of the mess it would cause. Um, but we came across the footpath and as soon as we reached like New York City and like Manhattan, um, they already had, they had a helicopter flying overhead the whole time. Uh, they had about twelve scooters, like eight motorcycles, and like four cruisers. And I kid you not, they shut down the entire city from George Washington Bridge to Times Square. Um, it's, it was like you're running the New York City Marathon, but you're not completely out of breath, and you're at the very front of the pack with just a completely open road in front of you. Um, you know, we were doing about a 10-minute pace, just kind of holding steady. We got the car out front of us, and, you know, the motorcycle cops are just ripping down the side of the road, closing off intersections, 
um, and they had it closed down so far ahead that there was like there was no traffic on uh, was that Central Park West, um, like not a single car on the road, and the streets are just lined with all these people trying to figure out either they knew what was happening or they're standing there and like what's going on. All of a sudden, there's a part of this event that's running through, um, you know. To so to have that level of support from the city was absolutely insane. And then getting to Times Square, you know, I don't think there's many people that can claim they stood on the roof of an RV in Times Square to pop champagne bottles and NYPD was standing there with you doing it too. Um, it was absolutely insane. Um, and I think it just made that much more of an impact to to our cause and, and to, you know, the people of New York and and everyone else of you know how important this was for us and how important especially for them for the NYPD um this event was so it, it was insane it was incredible what were the the feelings do you even remember what you were feeling or was it completely like flow state zen fully where your feet were it was i think a lot of people expected me to be pretty emotional about it um but quite honestly, you know, getting to the end was just more of like a just a relief that I don't have to wake up to see Rob's face in the morning when he wakes <laughs> me up to run again. Um, like I can just sleep in tomorrow. That was like the relief in my head. Um, or like I didn't have to run. You know, it was like what at three o'clock. It's like I don't have to run for another five and a half hours today. Like I'm done. Because um, I think a lot of that. A lot of that emotion, I think, was a lot earlier for me, having been on the journey so long. And um, some of those you know, cases were with some of the people that I had the chance to meet on the road. And so for me, I think a lot of that emotion is already flushed out for me. And, you know, there's still like the excitement of like popping the champagne bottles with the crew and, and having a blast there. But really for me, it was mostly a sense of just like, relief that thank god we have finished like i'm so happy to be done you mentioned you thought maybe 200 people would show up did you have a final calculation did did people figure out how many people came out um i don't know i didn't really look behind me because if i turned around i was gonna get you know trampled by the amount of people um i don't have an accurate number but the nypd is sending us a bunch of aerial footage they took um, from the helicopter for use in the documentary. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to task Brady, our media guy to start counting heads for me so we can get a, we can get a rough number. Over under a thousand. <sighs> people, people running specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're under, I'm okay. going to roughly say, I want to say 800. I think that's, crazy. that's my guess. But again, it's so hard for me to tell because I like I try to look over my shoulder and it's like I have no idea like how far back the amount of people goes. So sure. I'll go eight hundred. We'll see what happens with that. <laughs> I hate to be this guy, and I, I hate when I hear podcasts with people who have done remarkable things and they ask what's next. But I'll yeah. be that guy. What, what's next for you? What's on your heart? Uh, it's all good. We know it's coming. Um, right now, I'm just finishing out the year um, with some races. Um, I've got a couple more ultras. I got a 24 hour. Um, I've got a hundred and then I'm headed back to UTMB this year again, which will be a lot of fun. Um, I'm already starting to pick up a couple of, you know, extra races on the side. Like yesterday I got signed up for the, uh, Brooklyn half marathon in New York. So I'm going to pick up a bunch more events, having some fun. Um, it's really about trying to get all the strength back, getting myself kind of back to where I was before we started with the run. And then I have some thoughts for, you know, big projects. Um, I'm still kind of, I'm working on them, so I don't have anything concrete yet. But I think the part that I'm probably most looking forward to right now is um, getting to crew some of the crew members for, for like for their races. You know, they spent two months basically attending to every single one of my needs where all I did was eat, sleep, run and complain. And they did everything else. And so... Um, you know, they've got some cool races coming up and scheduled in the next year or two. So getting a chance to go and, and crew them and, 
be warm, dry, and comfortable in the vehicle while they're out suffering is going to be a nice change of pace. Paul, one final serious question for you. For those who have listened to our conversation, are inspired by you, your story, what you just accomplished, what would be the final takeaway message you want to leave with them? Commit. You got to commit. Um, you know, a massive goal like this, um, I had no idea how to even start planning for the transcon, how, where to start. Um, and you just have to set a massive goal and commit to it. You know, for me, it's the accountability of saying, hey, I'm going to run this and start telling people. And I'm like, oh, damn, I guess I have to actually do this because I told people. Um, and just, you know, you're not going to know how to do it, whatever it is that you're you're setting yourself up for. But just start knocking out those little goals at the front, um, little by little. And eventually you're going to find your way and you're going to figure out how to get it done. And you know, that's what we did with the Transcon. So. Yeah, you just just commit to something and, and start taking those little bites. Paul, final question. I ask every single guest on every single episode, if you had Gordon Ramsay coming over to your house for dinner, what would you choose to make for him? What would I choose to make for him? Yes. Oh, man. Um, I'm going to make him some potatoes. I, I love potatoes. I'm going to I'm going to take a potato. I'm going to cut it up into wedges, throw it in the oven with some paprika, some avocado oil. We're going to salt it up. I'm going to pull them out. Homemade French fries. And we're just going to have potatoes. I don't. I got nothing to do to impress them. I'm just going to eat my potatoes. <laughs> I love it. Stay true to yourself. You know, if you like it, he might like it. You never know. Paul, really appreciate our conversation, man. Uh, truly inspiring what you accomplished. And appreciate you taking the time to, to break it down in more depth. And um, I certainly can say I'm inspired. And I have no doubt it'll inspire the thousands who listen. So keep crushing it. Get those legs ready. To, to rip something else crazy, as you're mentioning. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.